Welcome to the Alan Elkan Interviews, an unprecedented window into the minds of some of the most well-known and respected figures of the last 25 years. We are today with Lily Cole, with us from Portugal. She is a, a British model, an actress, an entrepreneur, and she did many interesting films, including the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, a film of Terry Gilliam, who was very famous, and she is also taking care of many activities. Who Cares Wins is her book, How to Protect the Planet You Love, published by Penguin. And we could say that the synthesis of her thinking is optimism for a more sustainable and peaceful future. Right? Good morning, Lily Cole. Good morning. How are you? I'm very good. Uh, How are you? Uh, all right. Thank you. So where are you at the moment with your many different facets you know uh, somebody says that uh, you left top modeling where you were very successful and uh, maybe you're going to go back again can you can you tell us a little bit what is your what are your plans what are you doing it's a good question i ask myself it all the time <laughs> because i feel i'm constantly juggling multiple balls but that's been my way since i was a teenager um, at this point in time, I have a few companies I set up that I'm still an advisor to. So that takes a little bit of time, but not full time. I still have a kind of big passion for film and filmmaking. And I started directing as well in the last few years. And so I'd like to direct and potentially act more. And yeah, with fashion, I stepped away from the fashion world for quite a few years. And actually in recent times, have felt the desire to to kind of Re not hugely re-embrace that world, but be open to re-embracing that world, recognizing all the kind of creative, positive people that I worked in that industry. And also the fact that it feels like the industry is becoming much more responsible. I mean, not the whole industry, but there is more and more brands trying to make products in a better way. And so I'd like to, yeah, uh, embrace that. Your life, I mean, your career is interesting in the sense that you became a very young model, right, at age 16. And then you had the British Fashion Award in two of modeling. But in the same time, you read uh, uh, literature at the King's College uh, in Cambridge. And you are also, I read somewhere that you even own a share in a bookstore. So, <laughs> you, yeah very close to the book world also because you just wrote one and and in the same time fashion how did it happen well it, modeling is an interesting thing I started when I was 14 and I always thought it's quite a curious job in the sense the the thing that pulls together models as a group of humans is purely their genetic makeup right that they had the right genetic make, makeup for that particular moment in time to be asked to model um, unlike most industries, whereas most industries will pull together a group of people based on an interest, right? That people choose to be working in a particular area. And so, yeah, within the kind of modeling world, you have a very eclectic group of human beings. Um, and so for me, it's not that I chose modeling, it's that modeling chose me. And it just happened to be that I was quite bookish. <laughs> and I, yeah, I guess I've always been quite geeky and enjoyed learning and enjoyed there yeah, the kind of studious aspect of school and so when I started modeling I made the decision at 16 to carry on with my education and then again to go back to university I don't think with a particular career path in mind but I just knew that my brain wanted to be fed by that and it also in a way was a kind of grounding counterbalance to the modeling fashion world at the time I think you worked for big names like McQueen, Galliano, Gautier, Versace. You work for companies like Hermès. Uh, you work for magazines like Vogue and Harper's. Who are the people that you were particularly interested in to, or you had particularly important experiences with during that time, your fashion time, let's say? In terms of designers... I particularly liked doing the Couture Fashion Week in Paris because I loved the kind of 
madness and theatricality of it. It wasn't just walking in normal clothes. It had a kind of performative aspect. So that was, you know, Dior and Le Croix and um, Galliano and um, Jean-Paul Gaultier. They put on these kind of elaborate shows. And I guess because I've had this performing instinct since I was young, always wanting to kind of make plays and act, that I found more um, kind of inspiring. And I also particularly loved Alexander McQueen because also, I mean, his clothes were obviously amazing and very, very creative, but also his shows were incredible. His shows were like performance kind of theatre. Um, I did a show in Paris where it was half models, half dancers, and we had to kind of dance. The whole show was a dance piece. And that to me was kind of pretty thrilling. Um, and then lots of great photographers that I worked with too, Stephen Mizell, Tim Walker, Nick Knight. Um, I was really, yeah, I was very uh, inspired by the amount of creativity that manifests. You think in, in, in the model, or at least you, there was a component of narcissism in this uh, idea of being acting or being photographed by all these famous photographers? <laughs> That's a funny question. I mean, inevitably a bit, but, it, but at the same time, not. And it's a real kind of head, sorry, for the want of a better word, being a very young, successful model, because on the one hand, you're being told you're amazing and beautiful and gorgeous and fabulous and all these things and on the other hand you're self-employed and you're there's a vulnerability to the job that you can be hired or fired or let go at any point based on purely how you look and so it also breeds insecurity at the same time so I don't know if it's simply narcissism and in terms of the performative element that wasn't I don't think that for me personally was narcissism that was because I was inspired to be watching performances you know to be part of something that felt theatrical as opposed to industrial. But how did you manage, you know, the glamour, let's say, of these performances uh, that you just named in Paris with these very colorful and talented designers, and then the anonymity of being a student in Cambridge? Yeah, I mean, I just, <laughs> it was always hard to be objective about oneself and one's life. I think the kind of, the simplicity of school was a really nice, healthy counterbalance, you know, that I could return to my friends and my friends didn't, I didn't dress in any special way and my friends didn't see me as... In a particular way because you were in the cover of Vogue or Harper's. No, no, no. And my good friends from that time are still my good friends today. And I was very lucky, I think, that I had a really great group of friends. I think when I went to Cambridge, it was slightly different because... Yeah, I was maybe a bit more guarded because there was sometimes paparazzi and I felt that a little bit more. This, Even if you know I wasn't dressing up in a particular, I would dress up in a terrible way, <laughs> like even if I wasn't dressing up in a fancy way. I did feel that um, from students who didn't know me sometimes. But again, I managed to make a few friends that felt very genuine and still are friends of mine today. And I think, yeah, then it was quite easy to just be real. And then in 2009, you know, just more or less at the same time that you study history of art, you are called by Terry Gillians, a very special director, very particular director, to be a character in the film The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. You were playing the role of Valentine, working with actors like Christopher Plumb and uh, Heath uh, Ledger, right? I mean, on this level of actors. How come? How did, you know, and then you obviously have been nominated and the film had uh, great um, success uh, also on criticism and so on and so forth. How did you jump from fashion, Cambridge, to Terry Gillian's? <laughs> well, actually, I did Terry's film before I went to Cambridge and I had to postpone going to Cambridge by a year in order to do the film. In terms of why it happened, I mean, you have to ask the gods, but <laughs> but um, I personally had been wanting to act since I was a young child. It was something that had always kind of yeah, driven me as a kid. And as soon as I started modelling, very quickly, I was started dreaming up, how can I act, you know, and, and really wanting to. And it, I think it was just kind of amazing luck that it worked out. I was asked initially by Marilyn Manson, randomly, to be in a film that he was making based on an adaptation of Alice in Wonderland. And that just came out the blue that got sent to me and I started engaging with those conversations. We made a short film, but we never made the feature length film. 
And then I was asked to work on a different project with Sally Potter, who's another wonderful director. And she made a film called Rage, which was about the fashion industry. And I did the audition for her film and I got the part for that. And the casting director was also casting Terry Gilliam's film. So then put me forward for Terry's film. So it all happened. I didn't have an acting agent at the time. It all happened in quite a kind of magical, serendipitous way. I was also cast in St. Trinian's. So I'd done a couple of small things. And then, yeah, was incredibly privileged to work with Terry and, and the actors that you named um, on, on Dr. Panassas. And then you also act uh, later as Nina in The Seagull, uh, the play The Seagull uh, in Cambridge again, in the theatre in Cambridge, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was more a school production. But yeah, my last year at Cambridge, I thought it would be worth... I hadn't been very involved in the drama department at Cambridge because I was still traveling a lot and working a lot. So I wasn't there enough to commit to plays. And at the very end, I was like, I need to do a play before I leave. So I worked on that one. But in the meanwhile, you develop not only companies, uh, not only do you bought a, a share of a bookshop, but you created the impossible, no? impossible.com company and then you also created environmentally friendless knitwear people who came together to help uh, some meaningful problems and guide what is very interesting for you which is the global change right so i think you are very involved in uh, this world of global change a uh, sustainable world you're very preoccupied by that yeah you, you have yeah. been because you're not anymore? No, no, no. I, I, I am still. I just, if I look back, it has been a preoccupation is a good word for it. It has been a big pre preoccupation of mine. Yeah, and so what do you, what is your philosophy today? Somewhere I read that, for instance, you like to travel and the difference of what you did when you were an acting model, you know, that you moved for three days to Tokyo and then you go to New York and blah, blah, blah. You discovered the slow traveling right and is it true i mean pleasure of slow traveling and eventually the pleasure of a slower life yeah i mean those are maybe two different questions to deal with separately but in terms of the slow traveling that's kind of where how i've been trying to reconcile the fact that i've been personally trying to like lower my carbon footprint and make more conscious choices in what i eat and what i buy and the area that I've really struggled with is travel because my job has required that I travel a lot. And also because, to be frank and honest, I love traveling. I love seeing new cultures, new places. There are many positives I see that come out of travel. And so what I've done in the last few years is try to adopt a slower approach to travel. Yeah, I have an electric car or take trains when I can. And when I do fly, try and make it a longer trip. And so I fly less, essentially. It's not perfect, but that's been my approach. And I feel like it fits in with the slow movements we see across many other different sectors, like slow food movement, slow fashion, that with all of these industries, actually like a philosophy of slowing down can have a positive impact, both in terms of our footprint, but also in terms, I think, of our happiness and our ability to enjoy experiences and appreciate the things we have. In terms of your, your first yes. question around global change, I... Yeah, I think I, you know, I was, I was brought up by a very kind of activist mother and I'm sure she impacted me in many ways. And when I started working in fashion, I was able, I was, I was not only working with, with big companies, but I was also being approached by different charities and organizations to support different causes. And being quite a curious person, I would start exploring these ideas and trying to learn more about the different issues that we were facing. And what I quickly came to realize was that it didn't make sense for me to like be doing work with companies and in the business world with no worries about how it was being made and done. And then separately to do philanthropy or charity work and to separate those two spaces out didn't make sense because business has this huge impact on the planet and that impact can be very negative or it can be very positive. And so I came, became more interested in trying to work with companies and support products that I believed in more. And then that led me to different ideas of businesses to found. Um, not because I wanted to be a business person at all, but more because I would have ideas <laughs> and then be like, oh, let's try and do it. And then accidentally have a, have a business that I needed to, needed to manage. 
at the end of the day, you publish this book, Who Cares Wins, right, with Penguin. What do you write in your book? What is the philosophy of this book? Sure. So I had written the book. Initially, Penguin had asked me if I'd write about one particular project I, I did, which was a gift economy platform. It was the beginning of impossible.com. And it was how do we use technology to connect communities to share more so that we can have kind of yeah, a more sustainable but also a happier way of living. And I worked on that platform for several years and I did start writing about that project and it became one chapter of the book. But in the process of writing it, I went back to Penguin and I said, you know what, I've been working in this kind of social, environmental, political space, for want of a better word, for the last 15 years. And I've seen so much positive change. I've seen so many trends going in a positive direction. And whilst the news around the climate crisis is getting ever more scary, and there's a lot of negativity in the news, I feel like there's not enough focus on actually the solutions and the positive trends that are emerging. And could it be interesting to write a book that collects together different solutions and, yeah, trends that are going in the right direction, which if we as individuals and as communities and as companies and even as politicians help to push, we are more likely to then see succeed. And so the book became, in a way, a compendium of different solutions that people are working on and I researched a ton and I interviewed probably a hundred plus people working in different fields from food to fashion to technology to waste to indigenous communities to feminism trying to present a fairly comprehensive view of the huge number of people who are working on solutions and if we give them our support in various different ways they are more likely to to come into being. You obviously because you preach it, you are an optimist, right? But how can you, you said that we, we have done a lot of progress and things like this. So I see in the world of today, in a way there is, as you said, uh, going back to a slower pace somehow and uh, to more happiness. And in the same time, there is uh, an increasing speed in the world of technology, and, uh, artificial intelligence, and so on and so forth. How do you see the world and how do you combine these two? I mean, the technological huge and quick progress and your philosophy of life. Mm. I mean, I wouldn't say that I am necessarily an optimist. There are many days and times where I feel fairly pessimistic. But I think why I write about optimism is about the fact that we can choose optimism and it's something that I try to keep choosing, sometimes more successfully than others. Because for me, you know, the reality is what it is and the situation is what it is. But we have available to us the chance to help navigate which direction the future goes in. And so I think in the way my philosophy is based, actually a big belief in like the power of every single person put together collectively that to realize the power we each have in shaping the future and to not feel kind of like apathetic and that it's out of our hands but that actually we can play our small part in directing the future we want and that's where I derive optimism from Um, and as I said some days some days more than others in terms of the direction that things are going in I mean I'm not a prophet and I'm not going to pretend I am it definitely feels like there is a hugely strong march towards a techno future in many different ways for good and for bad. But at the same time, I think that if you look at like social movements and social progress over the last few centuries, and that's not to pretend everything's been positive, then it's not to pretend that there aren't huge challenges we still need to face. But we have, you know, legally abolished slavery. We have given women the rights to vote. We've built welfare states. We are now creating kind of carbon targets and putting more pressure on companies to, to perform in a positive way way like if you look at the kind of wider perspective it does feel like there is a lot of positive change underway i think of martin luther king's quote he was quoting i think theodore parker when he said the moral arc of history is long but it bends towards justice and i guess that's where i drive some optimism is that it feels like there is the opportunity to and it is underway this this desire that many humans have to make things better we, um, yes, I would like to, before asking you something else, I just would like to ask you, which is your 
position you're thinking about this Me Too movement that is somehow changing a lot of uh, of moral situations in uh, all over the world? Are you in favor? Do you think that uh, it's done well, that it's excessive, that it isn't? What is your thinking? I definitely support the underlying premise. There is plenty of data and like, very clear information that shows us that structurally there is an imbalance still between, broadly speaking, kind of male and female power. And I think that's the underlying structure within which you have situations where men have abused the fact that in many ways they often have more power. And I think a kind of movement to rectify that is positive and positives come out of it. I don't wholly subscribe to how it's manifested. I don't like a kind of like cancel culture, witch, witch hunts, trials by media. I don't think that's always um, helpful or fair to society. You know, we have judicial processes for a reason that, you know, people are innocent until proven guilty. And I feel like sometimes in this cancel culture that gets ignored. And so I have mixed feelings about how it's manifested um, at times. Tell me something. Uh, this is more practical. Um, you talk about um, sustainable world, big ideas and so on and so forth. Are you also keen on particular diets? Do you have a special uh, relationship with the food and uh, all these kind of different ways of eating and, and um, growing your vegetables and so on and so forth? Very much so. I think that food is one of the biggest things we can think about when it comes to our impact. Unfortunately, I'm not growing my own vegetables at the moment because we just moved, but I was growing them last to, year. You just moved, you moved to Lisbon? Moved from England to Portugal. So yeah, I have yet to set up a new garden. In England, we had a garden and I was growing some vegetables, which was fun. And then in terms of what I eat, I try to be mostly vegan. It's been a kind of slow journey to get here. I became vegetarian when I was 10 years old and then pescatarian at some point and then I cut out dairy and then I cut out eggs but eventually now I'm mostly vegan just because the it began in the, in the very very beginning it was about animal rights but now it's also about the environment because the the data and even the risk of pandemics which is connected to animal agricultural industry it feels yeah like the right decision and where I can, I buy organic and local and seasonal, but it depends how, where I am and if that's accessible or easy. But Are you a good cook? No, I don't think I'm particularly good. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm honest, no. I think I'm all right. I think I could, I'm a good baker. I love baking. But uh, cook, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I, I don't think I care enough to be a really good cook. <laughs> Are you? But how... And how did I am not terrible, but how did you spend this <laughs> coronavirus time? Did you did this time help you to mature some different ideas? Uh, you think uh, it will make you change? You think that the world around you will change after that? I mean, what is your? I mean, the pandemic is not over, but at least uh, there is a vaccine. I mean, there are still, there are some results going on. I mean, especially in England where they massively vaccine people. And uh, therefore, there is a slight optimism that uh, the world will come back to normal, but maybe the normal will be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would hope in a way that it is a different normal, that we have, we all do take stock and have learned something from this experience. For me personally, it has had an impact. I mean, I'm in Portugal. We were planning to move to Portugal. That was a decision made last year in the midst of the pandemic. And I would like to, to build more of a relationship to land and like, um, you know, have a kind of place in the countryside that I can nurture, so to speak. And um, in terms of my work, I mean, I work so much on the computer anyway, that it didn't really disrupt my work that much. I was publishing my book last year, running the companies that I mentioned, and then I've started writing a new project that I want to work on. So it's, it, hasn't, it hasn't massively changed my workflow. I did find that it made me slow down initially, and I felt that was really positive. I felt a bit like I'd just, I just finished writing my book, and then I was forced to like 
eat my own medicine. <laughs> you know, of all the ideas I talked about, it was like they were forced on me. Stop, slow down, simplify. Don't move, don't travel. <laughs> but what about your your bookshop? I mean, uh, your bookshop, I imagine, was closed for a while, right? Yeah, the bookshop, which is Claire de Rouen Books, has been closed for a while. And my can friend we, Lucy can, runs it. Can we know where is your bookshop? So it used to be in Soho in London, but it's not there anymore. And now Lucy, who runs it, does kind of different pop-ups and off-sites. And then she sells online as well. So it's called Claire de Rouen Books and it's a um, specialist in photography and art books. Why do you, now that you are age 32, 33, why do you desire to go back to, to, to fashion? You know, to, you want to be modeling again. I mean, you, you're not anymore a teenager or student or beginner, right? And also fashion yeah, has changed. So many of the names you, you work for, uh, either they are not anymore, or they're getting older and they're new people. And, you know, I mean, I guess the fashion world has changed too, right? Yeah, it's not, um, it's not that I'm dying to go back into it. I've still got a very busy life doing other things with my, with my companies. Now I'm writing a script that I want to direct. It's more that I feel like the attitude I had through my twen a lot much of my 20s, which was quite anti, not anti-fashion, but I was very closed to doing anything. And I said no to a lot of opportunities when they came through. It's in the last few years, I've, I've let go of that and focused more on the positive of, of the industry and, and yeah, just being more receptive actually to the, to the very many positive experiences and people I worked with. And so that feels, I think that feels actually like a very good way to be you know I don't think it's always I think being open and receptive as a human being is probably a better space to be in than being closed <laughs> so yeah it's not that I'm trying to go back rather than that I'm I'm open again to the fact that there will be interesting opportunities and I don't need to be close to them and also I'm kind of curious to see how the industry has changed because I've I've heard that from friends of mine who work in the industry that it's changed a lot both, as you say, in terms of the people, but also in terms of, I think, the values and the, the kind of, yeah, the, the kind of values underpinning the industry. And it sounds to me very kind of positive, those changes. And so I'm just curious to see that. But uh, do you think that we're talking about fashion in the fashion world, in the modeling, uh, in the way to do the shows? I mean, do you think there are many new, young, interesting talents that there is a new generation coming out. Oh, I'm sure. Some people say that fashion is going to, to end in one way, right? Because uh, I don't know. What is your what is your No, I'm idea? curious. You probably you probably know more than me. Tell me what you think. I am asking you questions. Um it sounds like you know more than me on this though. I don't know. I'm I've been outside of the industry for so long. But it makes sense to me that it would have changed a lot and that it will be very disrupted as well by digital and that there are, you know, many new young creative voices and, and ways of thinking. I've also read different designers crit like critiquing the relentlessness of the, the shows and the need to create so many different collections and actually a desire for more kind of slow output, which I think is interesting. Um, and it'll be interesting to see, I think, also how the pandemic reshapes the industry right. and if you know if shows will happen again or if actually there are new ways of thinking about showing clothes and collections that don't require you know thousands of people to travel to multiple cities multiple times a year to see them i mean obviously fashion has changed quite a lot you ask me what i think Personally, I think that people were much more elegant if fashion is, means elegance uh, in my youth than they are today. But I console myself because 
being a person who is wearing a traditional suit with a traditional tie, uh, when I travel, I feel like a hippie in the sense that uh, among millions of people in blue jeans with cuts everywhere and uh, uh, anoraks, uh, cheap value, you know, I love to have a proper coat and a suit. And I find myself very eccentric. When I was young, that was absolutely normal, right? And uh, for women, is more or less the same. I used to like to see a woman dressed in a tire or in a whatever. And uh, nowadays, not even hippies. They're not, they're no. You know, you never see a woman dressed uh, unless uh, sometimes it's a politician who appear or an ambassador that you see in an official ceremony or whatever. I mean, if you are British, right? The royal family, yeah. the English royal family used to dress more or less like the English people do, right? Now they keep on dressing the same way, but the English people have completely changed. You see what I mean? So I'm yeah, asking yeah, yeah. myself, are we going to a completely destructured, a weird world where a pair of jeans with cuts cost six times more than a regular one uh, new? Uh, or uh, people will, at the end of the day, one day go back, you know, for instance, and I finish. You know, when I was a young person, we used to change to buy a shirt, to have a shirt, and they gave you colors that could be changed if they became used. Or if you had shoes, the shoes were repaired and repaired endlessly, and you were very proud of your old shoes, very well kept. This never happens anymore today, right? Everything is just for a season, a month, and so on and so forth, and people wear sneakers everywhere. And so probably we would not even be shoes anymore. So I don't know if it's just the nostalgia of an old man, you know, who in the 18th century would have liked to keep on having a wig instead of not having a wig, <laughs> or if uh, the world is going to go back to some more, you know, to again to to a different uh, world. That's super I mean, interesting. I made, um, I made a statement more than a question, but I am interested in knowing what the new generations feel, you know, because you are not anymore fighting against your parents, uh, you know, and trying to have a new independence because nowadays parents are dressed like their children and little children, instead of being dressed like children, they are dressed the same way the parents, right? It's smaller blue jeans, smaller t-shirts, smaller sneakers, <laughs> but the same. Instead, when I was a child, children were dressed as children, parents, young people were dressed in a way, older people, in a, you see, there, was, there were some rules. And also, mm -hmm. as you very much like slowness and sustainability, we were mending things. We were keeping them with much more care. And you would say, mm -hmm. I go to this tailor, is expensive, but it, the suit will last forever, right? Or will last a long time. This notion is not anymore in, in the education. So that's what I would like to ask you. Yeah, I think that's super interesting. Um, I often wonder, you know, when we look back on the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and even the 20s, different um, eras, it's very easy to see what the fashion was for that time, you know, and That's right. we all have an idea of that fashion. And I often try and wonder that for our own time, what will this, this decade look like or these last two decades in the future? Because as you say, it's hard to see it in the present, but it also feels a kind of like a mismatch, a mixed match. In terms of your point around slowness and mending, I think that's essential right now for us to try and recover some of that. And we see it in all industries, not just fashion, but this movement over the last century, really, of um, as mass production happened and products became cheaper and cheaper, they also became more disposable. And we've ended up with a huge kind of overconsumption of stuff and huge amounts of landfill. And I think culturally, this idea that of a, a kind of very wasteful relationship to clothes and to material things that we think we can just buy new and throw them away 
I think something like three quarters of the clothes that are bought every year now end up in landfill, billions and billions of garments. And so actually looking at quality rather than quantity and investing, as you say, in, in a good pair of shoes or a beautiful suit or a beautiful dress that you're going to look after and treasure for many years and fix and have a kind of long-term relationship with and maybe even pass on feels to me so important as a way, as a shift of a way of thinking. This morning, incidentally, it's funny you use the example of shoes. A friend of mine bought new shoes yesterday because his shoes, which I gave him, um, well, I didn't give him, but I got given and I passed on to him a year ago. I was doing a shoot and I got given these shoes that were men's shoes and I passed them on to him. And they only lasted a year and now they're falling apart. And so he went to buy new shoes and I was just like, that's so ridiculous. Like, how can we be making shoes that only last a year? You know, I have boots that I've had for 15 years that are still good quality, you know, <laughs> like, and I just use that as an example of, yeah, this, um, the way that, of manufacturing things nowadays, we think it's, I think many consumers think it's cheap, but it's actually not cheap because it's expensive if it only lasts 10 minutes and you have to buy again and buy again and buy again. And actually, if we pay more and invest in something that's very good quality um, and that we can repair and we want to repair, then it ends up being cheaper in the long term, even if it's more expensive in the, in the beginning. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but... It makes, it makes sense, but you. you know what? It has to do... I understand that fashion... It can be seen in in different ways, right? Uh, and you know, fashion in general, which has to do with art, with movies, with music, with uh, clothes, with way of living, interior interior decoration, furniture. You know, it always existed, right? that you change. You suddenly don't like old furniture anymore because you want uh, modern, blah, 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 or old masters, you change against contemporary art. Uh, you know, th there's always been fashion somehow in, in the world, right? But uh, in the terms of education, uh, you know, one in my generation was, uh, as you said, you know, he was affection. You know, I had, a, let's say, a jacket and I was proud to think that I was wearing the jacket since 30 years, you know, and I mended it and I was very, and very proud of that, right? Therefore, the jacket assumed importance in life, you know, and if you miss it in your cupboard, you suddenly say, where is this jacket? Instead, nowadays, it looks, you go to Uniqlo, and uh, you buy a jumper and blah 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 and if it's you know if it's it doesn't cost much you can buy three instead of one you know there is this completely different um society right which obviously is nice for people who cannot afford uh, because they may afford more things than they did before but um there is this education to because I hear, I hear a lot of the, the word sustainable and this and that, but um, I am a little afraid about education, you know, when I mean, how one is educating his children, in which values, in which, you know. So the food, as you said, is extremely important to, to be, uh, to be um, not careful, but to be aware, to be you know, of what you eat and how you eat, but also about how you look. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the pricing point is a really important one and it's a really difficult one. And it's the one that often comes up the most in these conversations about kind of sustainable choices, because unfortunately, often sustainable choices, not always, but often do cost more, you know, organic food costs more, um, organic cotton in products sometimes cost more when I was when I was growing up my mum had hardly any money at all and when I first found I think I was probably maybe 12 years old or something um a shop that opened I won't name the name but it's like a famous kind of fast fashion shop that was selling clothes at this unbelievably cheap prices and I remember it was so exciting I was so excited because suddenly, you know, I had my, my pocket money or my Christmas money, whatever money I had to put together. And I was suddenly able to buy so much, you know, <laughs> to me as a kid, it was like mind blowing. I was just like, wow, like t-shirts are a pound. And I couldn't believe it. 
And in the innocence of that moment where I didn't really understand supply chains and production and the environment and any of these uh, kind of issues, I could just enjoy it, you know, <laughs> buy, buy a bunch of clothes that I otherwise couldn't afford. But it was later when I you know, obviously started learning and researching and understanding how it's possible that things can be that cheap and the human cost in those supply chains and the environmental cost, let alone the fact that they probably will be made really badly and don't last very long that kind of made me open my eyes to the fact that it's not that saying if it's cheap someone else is paying for it you know that actually those those kind of very cheap clothes keep other people in poverty and that's a kind of painful truth to the situation and also that it's not actually as I was saying before it's not actually in a way that cheap because if they don't last more than 10 minutes then you're going to have to keep buying more if you don't exactly. mend them so there is um, so we live in a world <laughs> um, which doesn't really still have a solution, right? Because uh, the advantages and disadvantages uh, in in many ways, right? But you know what? I I mean, I'll keep drumming my drum about optimism, but I truly, I, it's based on the fact that I truly see that these things seem to be going in positive directions. I looked up the other day on Google Trends. You know, you can search words and see how they've been trending as searches on Google for the last 10 years or whatever. And I looked up sustainable fashion and it was a huge curve upwards. You know, there's been, and that's just one indicator of the fact that the sustainable fashion movement has been growing so much um, in the last 10, 15 years. And there's so much more awareness than there was 15 years ago when I was looking at this space. When I was looking at this space initially, it felt like very like hempy, ugly niche. That was the um, perspective of it. Whereas now I feel like there is much more awareness there. Some of the biggest brands in the world are trying to improve their impact and trying to have these conversations. And so we're not, we haven't solved the situation yet, but just the fact that it's going in that trajectory makes me hopeful that that will continue. And fashion, as you know, has an impact, as you mentioned, on all other industries too. So it reflects kind of wider change, I think. So I wish you good luck. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, I wish you to keep on fighting for your optimistic view. And uh, thank you very much for being with us. And keep on writing. I, I admit to say that you sometimes write articles on The Guardian, the Financial Times or the Huffington Post. So we are here waiting to read you again. Okay? Okay. So keep us Thank you posted so much. about your life and your achievement. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Alan L. Can interviews.